professor of history at George Washington University. And I'm very pleased to moderate this virtual book launch for my esteemed colleague, Benjamin Hopkins. Uh, the book is Ruling the Savage Periphery, Frontier Governance and the Making of the Modern State, uh, published earlier this year by Harvard University Press. I don't know how well you can see it, but here it is in its uh, non-virtual form, in its uh, print form. For those of you who don't know Ben, let me offer a brief introduction. He's an associate professor of history and international affairs and director of the Seeger Center for Asian Studies at George Washington University. He's a specialist in the history of Afghanistan and South Asia. His previous books include The Making of Modern Afghanistan, published in 2008, and Fragments of the Afghan Frontier in 2011, which he co-authored with Magnus Marsden. He and Marsden also co-edited Beyond SWAT, History, Economy, and Society along the Afghanistan-Pakistan Frontier, published in 2012. Now, Ben's new book, Ruling the Savage Periphery, also starts along the Afghan-Pakistan Frontier, but that is merely the point of departure for a study that literally ranges across the globe. Uh, ben examines what he terms frontier governance in a, a wide array of locations, Iraq, Jordan, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, Argentina, and the American Southwest. This is, in short, a remarkably ambitious book. Ben argues that the colonial and national states ruled each of these places in the late 19th century, instituted remarkably similar systems of governance over peoples uh, that they characterized as savages. And far from being peripheral to the main preoccupations and governing practices of these states, Ben argues that they are in fact integral to our understanding of those states. So it's, an, it's a richly documented, compellingly argued, and utterly original study, and one that should be of interest to a wide range of scholars. So I'm gonna stop talking, I, apart from uh, asking a series of questions to Ben. And since uh, the uh, run up to this uh, event, uh, Ben mentioned that there was an interesting story behind the title. Let's start with the title. Why is it titled Ruling the Savage Periphery, Ben? Well, thank you, Dane, for that very kind introduction. And to everybody listening, um, thank you very much for attending. I know uh, that you're strewn out um, across literally the globe in a number of different time zones. So uh, I really appreciate you attending. Um, I, I joked with Dane before we started that this is actually my first book launch, even though I've had a, a number of books. And so I'm uh, used to being on the other side, sitting in Dane's seat rather than in the seat I'm presently occupying. So I hope I'm able to, to pull it off as it were. Um, so the the title actually was the hardest thing I, about the book um, in the sense that normally uh, most of my books in the past have, have had a pretty self-evident title that, that manifested themselves as I was writing. And um, as I was writing this, the, the title kept changing. Um, the book's been published with Harvard University Press, and uh, my editor actually at Harvard um, really disliked the, the first title that I suggested, which was The Imperial Frontier, because it was an argument about the post-colonial world and how shaped by empire that world is. And she said, no, 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 you're making an argument about the state, not about empire, and, and you'll lose people with that. And so she offered a different alternative, which was all right and actually grew on me over time. But um, but ultimately, I, I wasn't wholly satisfied with it. And so then after further consultation and discussion, uh, I offered the, the one that uh, the book ended up with, uh, ruling the savage periphery um, frontier governance in the making of the modern state, because it's about the frontier and how the frontier as a category is a space of rule um, and how that influences the construction of the modern state. So the, the subtitle kind of says what it does and does what it says. But the main title um, 
was, and, and I acknowledge this, uh, is rather tricky. Uh, I mean, especially in the day and age we're living through, to put Savage right on the front of the book and not in any way kind of countenance it with quotation marks, um, which I did originally ask the uh, press to do, and they said under no circumstances whatsoever will we put quotation marks on the cover. Um, I knew that was uh, potentially provocative to say the least. Um, that was compounded with the back and forth we actually had about the cover, which was a kind of funny little anecdote. The first version of the cover they sent me actually had the ruling the savage periphery superimposed on two bodies of Native Americans. And I looked at them in horror and said, no, that, that's not at all acceptable. Um, and, and not at all what this book is about, because once you actually get into the book, I mean, very early in the book, you know, um, I, I engage with what with the language um, of, of why I use that term savage. Um, and and I, I think I sufficiently problematize it. But it was a really interesting um, uh, discussion with the press, which kind of goes to the economics of publication, as it were, that as an academic, on the one hand, very concerned about the, the messaging. Uh, it's coming out through what you're saying on the cover and the press on the other um, thinking about, well, we want to sell the book. Um, and so how do we do that? So uh, that's the kind of backstory uh, with the title. I mean, ultimately, um, I think the title uh, gets, as it were, the zeitgeist of the work, um, both the, the, the subtitle, but also the main title, as it really is about this space on the edge, the frontier, the periphery. And the, the, peop the people who inhabit that space, who I refer to in the book as the people of the periphery, who are throughout uh, the, the episodes that I document, uh, referred to um, either as savages or are barbarians, uh, but always uncivilized. And we can chat more about that um, in the substance of the work. But yeah, that's, that's where that really comes from. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I've, I've had my own experiences with editors and and changes of titles uh, under under pressure from from them. And frankly, uh, usually to the benefit of the book. So I, I, I um, so Ben, you, you make a a bold claim about the central role of frontiers and the peoples who inhabit them. Uh, in the making of the modern state, and I, I, I think it'd be useful if we start with the the main big argument here, so that people understand where you're coming from. Can you can you do that for us? Yeah, I mean the the book um, it tries to do two things that answer the same question, which is what you're getting at that argument about this space and the people that inhabit that space. And and the two things it does is on the one hand it tries to offer what I would like to think is a robust and sophisticated theoretical framing to this space uh, in, in the form of what I call frontier governmentality, and I can sketch that out. But then it tries to actually tie that down um, with you know historical specificity and say, hey, let's think about this not as a kind of foo-foo theoretical concept that might or might not have any bearing in reality, but let's let's um, see if it works in the historical record. Is this what the historical record tells us? Um, so that that's what the book is trying to do. And in trying to do that, it's 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 making a, a, a couple of claims and arguments. The central one, which you're referring to there, is that um, a kind of straw man argument it takes is this difference between the so-called center and the periphery, you know, the centers of state power or imperial and colonial authority uh, being in, in, in the capitals, um, or at least where you have a density of um, state networks and personnel and institutions, uh, and that's the center, you know, whether it be like Delhi in, in India or, um, uh, um, you know, whether it be uh, Washington, D.C. in the United States, these are the centers. And then out there on the edge, on the, on the liminality, as it were, of the state, both physically, but in terms of its projection of power, lies uh, what today we might call borders, um, borderlands, or, or these frontiers, these places that are kind of the, the back ends and forgotten bits. And 
really the, the central contention of the book is to try not simply to, to invert that, say, no, 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 the periphery is important, but to say actually that these two places um, can't be disaggregated in that way, that there's a complex dynamic of definition working back and forth between them. So on a practical level, you know, there are forms of administration that begin in the center and work their way out to the periphery, but likewise, there's forms of administration that are beta tested, as it were, on the periphery and then re-ingested back into the center and then regurgitated, at, as it were, out across the imperial space. So it's really trying to, to, at the very least, problematize, if not collapse that distinction of center and periphery, because I, I, I think it's very unhelpful in understanding both the phenomenon and processes of colonialism specifically, but more generally of state power. Right, right. And 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 one of the things you do here in, in the book, which I think is really sort of interesting and provocative, uh, is 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 the way in and to to the end that you're talking about. It's the way in which you rethink the frontier not as a place but as a practice, right? And so um, that that allows you to actually examine parallel or similar processes in a in a variety of different environments even if they're not on what we would normally see as the periphery and i think maybe it might be helpful to listeners as well if you could if you could explain how you how you do that because i think it's an important dimension of of your analysis well, and of course, it's incumbent on, on me to say I'm not the first person to argue the frontier, not as place, but as practice. Um, but what the work tries to do is it tries to give a definite form to that. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I, I think one of the things that um, we're, we're faced with is looking at the historical record. Number one, uh, frontiers are often mobile, right? They move over time. Um, especially out of the examples that I look at in the book, the, the number one example is uh, out of the fifth substan substantive chapter, the United States, right? Where we have this kind of westward rolling frontier over time. Um, so if it's a place, then how does it remain integr How does it retain its integrity as a category if that place keeps on moving? Mm -hmm. And so the way I conceptualize the frontier is as practice, or rather as a set of practices, this thing that I call frontier governmentality. Um, and that those practices, I don't want to denude frontiers of a territorial expression because they are in fact places, but rather they're constituted not by the place, but they're constituted by the practice as enacted in specific places. And I think in thinking about the frontier in that way, that it's a set of practices that manifest themselves in specific places over time, we can then answer this issue of, well, how do frontiers move over time? Well, because the practices that constitute them are expressed and manifested in different places over time. That's how, for instance, with the American West, you see the frontier move over time. Or with the Argentine Pampas, which is another one of my cat, uh, case studies, you see it move over time. What's interesting in the book then is that we have these frontiers of stasis, on the other hand. You, you mentioned that the book begins on the Afghan-British Indian frontier, which is today, of course, the Afghan-Pakistan frontier. And this is a frontier that in many ways is marked by stasis. It doesn't really move a whole lot. It becomes more and more defined over time. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that it's important to think about this category of frontier, not as place, but as practice. Um, and that uh, those practices, when manifest in a place and in their totality, uh, that's when we have a frontier. Okay, but uh, just to push it a little further, I mean, the, the argument that there, there are, in terms of practice, there are also certain characteristics of a frontier, right, in terms of its economic potential, in terms of the character of the people who inhabit that region, that sort of thing that, that, um, that allows you to sort of identify parallels across these very different um, uh, circumstances. Perhaps you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think what you're really asking is about what are the constitutive practices of the frontier, which is this this rubric I call frontier governmentality. And I identify in the book 
four practices that I think constitute frontiers and um, this idea of frontier governmentality. And that when these four are manifest together, um, there we have a frontier. And I'll, I'll say before I, I list them that th these practices, as it were, uh, are manifest elsewhere in the colonial order and in the state order. It's the particular constellation of them together in a specific place that constitutes the frontier. So that said, okay, what are my four practices of frontier governmentality? Um, well, first, uh, a practice of indirect rule. Uh, to put it simply, kind of ruling through the local headman or chief or holders of authority um, so that state or colonial power is not uh, directly administered in these places. Uh, number two, what I call in the book uh, sovereign pluralism, um, you might think of it as, as uh, layered sovereignty in the words of Lauren Benton, as suzerainty, uh, as, as others talk about, but it's um, a, a sovereignty that is definitely divided and a hierarchical so that you can talk about these people as having some sort of agency when in fact that agency is highly limited. The third category uh, is what I call imperial objecthood and this is probably the least intuitive but uh, uh, what I mean by that is that uh, actually defining it against what we normally think of the subjects of empire, which are colonial subjects, that they're subjects of a colonial empire, or even citizens of a state. They're on the inside, even though within that inside, they have very limited recourse, for instance, to legal redress. These people that inhabit the frontier and the state treats as the peoples of the periphery are on the outside. They're legally barred from accessing avenues of judicial redress uh, within the colonial or indeed national state. Um, yet that state still maintains the authority to act on them. And that kind of sounds like a really esoteric and, and highly theoretical way. So let me give a real world example. Uh, Native Americans. So the uh, Chiricahua Apache, who I examine in the uh, book, um, are an outstanding example because on the one hand, the United States in the late 19th century claims um, a sovereignty over Native Americans, that they have the sole right to ultimately govern these people, um, though uh, they, they often actually ignore that right or they don't actually exercise it. But it's, it's a right excluding other um, internationally recognized actors from interfering with that. But on the other hand, um, those Native Americans are barred from being recognized by the United States. In fact, there's this uh, kind of uh, um, fascinating case called, uh, 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 I think it's Crow Dog case. It might be Standing Bear. I think it's Standing Bear v. Crook, in which this case happens in 1879, and it's the first case where Native Americans are actually judged in a court of law as justiciable, where they can be recognized by a court of law. Before that, Native Americans had absolutely no standing in the eyes of the law. So even though they're entailed within the kind of ambit of action by the American federal government at this time, they still have no place within that political uh, arena. So they, they're objects of actions rather than subjects of action. So that's the third category, this imperial objecthood. And then the fourth, which is in contrast, much much more uh, intuitive is um, economic dependence, uh, that these people are rendered economically dependent on the surrounding state or colonial or imperial economy. And again, it's not the individual elements because you see these um, individual elements replicated across both national and, and formally colonial spheres, but it's been put together in a totality that they work in, in unison to create a particular system of administration, which I call this frontier governmentality.
Yeah. Okay. That's good. I, I, I noticed there's a, there, there is one question that's arisen and, and I just want to assure the person who, who wrote it, Melanie, that, that I, I, I I'm going to get to that myself in, in part of this conversation, although I do very much want everyone else to be involved uh, as, as well. Um, so one other point I think that that needs to be made clear to, to everyone listening is and and one of the things that that makes this this book really intriguing and and uh, provocative is that in many respects, even though you start off on the Northwest frontier with the frontier crimes regulation and then trace that as is it applied to different British colonial, circumstances, you're also dealing with nation states like like the United States and Afghanistan. And what's striking is that in some sense, you um, insist that in this respect, colonial, I mean, uh, frontier governmentality, that there really isn't a great deal of difference between the practices of, of, um, of co uh, colonial states and uh, mm -hmm. nation states. And I'm wondering if you wanted to sort of amplify on that point, perhaps just a bit more, why you think that's the case. So I could take the rest of the time and talk about that. <laughs> um, I mean, I, mean I, I, I think inherent in, in that argument and claim I'm making is that um, especially political scientists and to a lesser extent historians like to to kind of differentiate the colonial from the national state, that the colonial state is the immature, you know, younger brother or perhaps cousin of, of the national state, which rises in Europe and becomes diffused through colonialism through the 19th century and then matures uh, with the independence movements of the 20th century. And yet, um, you know, for much of the world, we're living in a post-colonial moment. And we, we talk about it as the post-colonial. And, and I think that's kind of the dead giveaway. It's it's post-colonial in the sense of it's still the colonial state. It's just operating under the guise of the national state. So, you know, again, to move away from kind of um, conceptual to practical, Pakistan is a fantastic example. I start on the northwest frontier of British India, and I start by looking at the areas called the independent tribal agencies, which are first established by the British in the 1870s. When Pakistan um, receives independence in 1947 with the transfer of power, they maintain these independent tribal agencies and they call them the FATA, the federally administered tribal agencies. There's also something called the PATA, the provincially administered tribal agencies that uh, rise alongside that. But the point being that, um, these, in essence, agencies, which are really just reservations, and I'll get to that point in a minute, uh, you know, they continue to today. It's only in 2018 that the Pakistani state passed a constitutional amendment to abolish the FATA. Uh, they have yet to fully enact that amendment, and we can talk about that, but, you know, th this is the colonial architecture brought forward. Um, I said these agencies are like reservations. I, actually want to go back to an anecdote I was thinking before we got on to, to kind of uh, perhaps give some insight into where this entire thing, uh, the genesis of this project. I remember sitting in the uh, archives um, years and years ago, too much, too many years ago that I actually want to admit. And um, for any PhD students that might be listening, this is a good lesson for you because it means take really good notes in the archives because I failed to do this in this particular instance. <laughs> but I was reading about some of the dispatches or reading some of the dispatches from um, uh, the, the British agents in the tribal agencies uh, from the Northwest frontier of British India in the late 19th century. And this was in the 1890s, so there's a, a series of religious revolts that happen at this time that actually make some people very famous, including Winston Churchill, because he goes out as a as a newspaper correspondent and he writes the the field of the uh, the notes of the Malakam Field Force. But this agent is talking about um, his observations of of what what I could gather from the uh, documents was a Sufi Kowali. So a Sufi Kowali is a I mean, Kowalis are, are kind of a, a mystical tradition within Sufism that, that is basically people around a, a shrine having singing and dancing. Um, and I, I remember reading 
this agent's report about this Sufi Kuali and how very dangerous this agent saw that Sufi Kuali. He saw this as a seditious uh, activity that these uh, native peoples were undertaking. And this is the point for the PhD students because I can't remember if it said it in the document or if my sense was palpable from the document, but I thought to myself, he's talking about ghost dancing, ghost mm -hmm. dancing like the Lakota Sioux. Mm -hmm. And it made me then think about, there's a, a similarity in the process of thought that these colonial agents share either intentionally, namely they're reading each other, or unintentionally for reasons that we can get into. And so to look at a Sufi Kowali and see the seditious potential of that, at the very same moment, you know, the forced march that ends at the massacre at Wounded Knee is going on really profoundly struck me and made me think, wait a minute, these tribal agencies that the British set up along the northwest frontier of British India, and they're clothed in the rhetoric of particularity. What do I mean by that? I mean, they're supposed to be a specific cultural answer to the inhabitants of that frontier, to the Afghans, right? And yet this is exactly the same thing that's going on contemporaneously in the United States where we have the establishment of over 330 reservations that have all these same markers as the tribal agencies, which the British set up on the Northwest frontier. And then that the British replicate um, around their own empire globally, and then other European powers replicate around their own empire globally. So in thinking about that, I was trying to think about the logic of the state, the logic of a bureaucrat, um, an increasingly bureaucratic state in the late, late 19th century. And even though, for instance, the British Indian Raj is a, you know, the, the uh, example par excellence, as it were, of the colonial state, in this particular instance, it's doing exactly the same thing as the American state, which is one of the you know examples par excellence of the national state. And the division between the two is not only nugatory, it's really non-existent along the frontier. Um, so these categories collapse and there's a state logic that doesn't differentiate between nation states on the one hand and colonial states on the other, which then gets me back to the original point, which is this is really about the lasting afterlife of the colonial order, the post-colonial world that we still live in. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that was, uh... Uh, the the first question that came up was about uh, how it could be applied today, and I think I think you've you've spoke spoken uh, to that issue. So I might pass on that question that because we're getting quite a few now, and I want to turn it to the the attendees and and uh, get your answers to their questions. So uh, Nilesh asks, uh, could you please speak on how this approach frontier governmentality engages with imperial history and recent iterations of world and global history. Uh, how does this approach to the frontiers contribute to recent discussions of global history? Now, there's a there's a small topic for you. <laughs> yeah, quite easy. Well, you know, on the, on the one hand, um, you could read this book as a return to a craft that is is really no longer practiced, and that is the the craft of comparative history, as it were, right? You know, and and why is it we don't do comparative history? Well, because inevitably, and in part rightly, um, there will be some Argentine his historians and some American historians that hopefully will read the book um, and point out what I've gotten wrong, because I'm sure I've gotten things wrong. Uh, hopefully in, in the details rather than in the larger drawing. Um, you know, and comparative work is hard um, or, or this kind of canvas to do on is hard. I mean, this project took me to archives in Delhi, in London, uh, in Tucson, Arizona, in uh, Buenos Aires, right? And um, I probably should have also gone to a couple more uh, like Nairobi and, and, and maybe South Africa, but, you know, finally, I just kind of run out of steam, to be perfectly honest. Um, so know that there's further opportunities for expansion that I, I hope other people might take up, some of which I couldn't because of my own uh, linguistic incompetence, because I think you see this frontier governmentality on other frontiers, 
Um, so on, on the one hand, it goes back to this kind of older tradition of comparative history. But on the other hand, um, yeah, I, I mean, th there is a move with imperial and indeed global or, or world history to think in this in this broader frame and to think about uh, the connectedness of the world in ages past. And definitely that's part of the story here. Um, there's both you know, stories embedded in the text about uh, what some have referred to as imperial careering. So there's a couple of characters that move around. Um, there's also the imperial careers of what I'd say ideas and regulations, you know, um, that certainly laws move around and the ideas uh, underlying those laws move around. So there's, there's a global conversation going on that I think this, um, or I hope it reveals. Um, there's also a story of global capitalism, I think really at the center of this, because ultimately, uh, as, as the book tries to argue, um, one of the reasons that states treat the people of the periphery this, this way is because of the, uh, the dictates and the logic of capitalism as it expands across the globe. Um, so I think there's a story of capitalism. I think there's a story of uh, the global growth of the modern state in the late 19th century. I mean, in, in a way, the story that's told in the book is very highly compressed temporally. Um, most of it takes place between about 1870 and 1885, which I remember when I was, you know, uh, thinking about this and, and researching it, just kind of blew me away that we have this relatively short period where so much of this uh, um, comes up. But I guess I, I, can I interrupt there because I, I, I I, so why 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 is that period so so central? Do you think in terms of this uh, sort of global expansion of these practices? Yeah, and and yeah. I think there's a number of issues that, truth be told, I I am not sure are as wholly fleshed out in the book as they should be. I think there's a technolo a, a story of technology there of communication technology, of transportation technology. Um, the world is just that much smaller. Um, because of, you know, revolutions in telegraphy, for example, um, the speed of movement that people are now able to undertake both by steamship, but also by, uh, by uh, railway. Uh, you know, we have the global introduction of the penny post under the Pax Britannica. Um, so we have a, a number of things going on. We also have um, what I think by the late 19th century is a pretty secure global capitalist economy dominated by uh, by Britain at that point in time, which is coming under increasing pres pressure. But, you know, finance capital is really reaching into just about every corner of the world. Um, I think also we're at a point where in terms of military technology, you know, by the 1870s, uh, there's a clear advantage for uh, uh, states in dealing with the peoples of the periphery. So, for instance, to go to the Afghan frontier, uh, between British India and and uh, Afghanistan. In the first Anglo-Afghan War, which is 1839 to, to 1843, um, you know, the, the British, uh, this makes me sound like a nerd that I can kind of talk about this, but the British Indian forces are using the brown, right, which is a smoothbore uh, 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 musket. Um, and they are going up against Afghans that have these seven foot long gazelles, which are long distance musketry. So it, it's, it's fairly similar military technology. Um, by the time we get to the period I'm talking about in this work in the 1870s uh, and 80s, um, we have repeating rifles uh, with smokeless cartridges, uh, you know, rifled artillery that you can bring up. And that, that becomes really uh, key in places like Argentina um, and, and also in other places uh, like uh, uh, British British India. Um, so I think there's a, a number uh, of elements going on there. And I think the last one that I would add is that um, I think it was Thomas Becker, uh, an American historian, who talks about the aftermath of the American Civil War, or talks about the American Civil War as the federative crisis of the United States. That you know we, we have these these political entities that. Um, uh, where central authority is, is subject to challenge. But by the 1870s, a lot of these emergent nation states, and also I would say colonial powers, have emerged from these federative crises. 
um, with the central state authority clearly on top. So the United States emerges from the Civil War, you know, 1865, and then begins uh, really the Indian Wars out west as expansionary wars. Argentina, the other nation state example, um, it emerges from the War of the Triple Alliance, which is really the last kind of federative crisis um, in the 1860s with Buenos Aires as the center of governmental power. So a very similar story there. Um, I'm not sure we have quite the same federative challenge within the imperial sphere, but definitely within British India, you know, after 1857 and the Great Revolt, uh, you know, the nature of centralized control from Calcutta and then subsequently in Delhi is palpably different than it was before. That. And I think a lot of it has to do with technology, but also changes to patterns of governance that include stuff like um, new forms of governing science with statistics. I mean, Apadurai's famous number in the colonial imagination. We can start to count these people and we can start to govern these people in a different way because of that counting. So I think it's it's all of that together, which which create this particular moment for the expansion of state power. And the last thing that I'd actually say on that, now that you've got me talking, <laughs> is that it's also a moment where these newly empowered states are able to assert themselves not only over their subject people or the imperial objects along the periphery, but over their own servants as well. And what I mean by that is, you know, as imperial historians, Many of us know the, the great anecdotes of people like Napier going to conquer Sindh, you know, when he's told not to do it. And then he sends back that missive Pakabi, I have Sindh, um, to cover his gambling debts, as it were. The, the colonial state or the national state has the problem of what Galbraith talked about as the man on the spot. And by the, the 1870s and 1880s, with these new technologies, the state can increasingly assert itself in a convincing manner, not only over the peoples of the periphery, over its own subjects, but also over its own servants. It can keep them on a shorter leash. Okay. Okay. I think we have around 10 more questions. Yes. To go <laughs> well, uh, we, we, we will try our best. All right. Uh, I, I noticed that there were a couple that, that I think, um, Ben, you've actually already uh, addressed. So I'm going to skip around a little bit. I, I apologize to some of you who've written your questions if, if yours don't get answered here. Uh, and I'm sure that Ben would be happy to uh, communicate with you uh, personally on. On some of these issues. Um, so one of the questions is, uh, I'd be curious to hear more about how the comparative approach you've taken changes or challenges histor how historians approach the history of frontiers. Or to put it another way, is your work a lineage of a particular kind of frontier thinking exported from one locale to another, or a paradigm of Frontiers writ large. It's a good challenging question, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not getting softball questions from this side. <laughs> um, <laughs> my ambition would be that it's the latter. That it's it's really about a paradigm of governance, uh, this frontier governmentality. Um, and maybe this is where one could fruitfully talk about frontiers as opposed to borders or borderlands, something which I specifically do not do in the yes. book and, and has a very rich um, and sophisticated and evolving um, um, uh, literature. Uh, some of whom, you know, some of the people who do that, I think, might be listening in. I mean, people like Elizabeth Leake or, or Kyle Gardner, Willem Van Schendel, um, really talking about um, the, these frontiers and borderlands or border spaces. If I could um, just, just inter intervene here, the question was from Kyle Gardner. Okay, thanks, Kyle. <laughs> um, no, I, I I would like to think that it it is this, uh, you know, the, this new typography. Um, and, uh, you know, part of what the, the book tries to do is, um, on the one hand, the first part of the book um, details an imperial his history, right? And it, it takes, it, 
the, the book is organized, first of all, by laying out the conceptual argument that we've been talking about here, and then looking at the practical uh, examples of this worked out uh, around spaces in the world. And the first half of the book is really a, a, an imperial argument in the sense of it traces a clear lineage through people and practices around the British Empire globally. I mean, it, it, it does go quite widely, but it starts on the British Indian frontier, it goes around British India, um, and it, it goes to uh, British Africa, et cetera, et cetera, in the Middle East. Um, but then the latter half actually looks at, at two cases, Argentina and the United States, where we don't have this clear imperial lineage. We don't have the imperial careering of somebody who cut his or her teeth. Well, his, I'm sorry, this is the 19th century, right? So um, his teeth as a government official, of course, um, his teeth on the Northwest frontier and then goes to the United States. That might have happened, but I, I didn't find it. So these are these are places that actually are evolving the same idea um, at the same time, but seemingly completely independent of one another. Now I know there's subsequent examples of then actually further kind of um, pan-imperial careering, as it were. So a great example that I can give that the book doesn't actually detail, and I'll give a shout out to uh, Andres Rodriguez, who's at the University of Sydney. He's a historian of China, works on uh, the Yunnan during the Republican period. And I remember at one point in time discussing my work with him. Um, and he's like, you know, this sounds like what the Republican government was doing to ethnic minorities along the borderlands in the 1920s. And so we start talking a little bit more and we finally figured out that there's actually a clear chain of transmission. And it was the YMCA because <laughs> the YMCA was charged with the Southwest reservations in the United States um, after the 1880s. And then the YMCA gets patronized, of course, by Chiang Kai-shek and the Republican government. And so the YMCA comes over and actually kind of brings that knowledge to Republican China. Um, so, so there are certain trains of chains, tr um, chains of transmission, as it were. But on the other hand, you could say, okay, well, that that's neat. You're you're talking about a specific type of frontier. These spaces that are um, that are out there. They have these problematic people that live on them. But then, actually, as as one of my colleagues, Joya Chatterjee, pointed out when I, I really began on this project, she's like, you're forgetting where the biggest frontier of British India is, Ben. It's not against Afghanistan or what will become the state of Afghanistan. It's inside British India. It's the 565 princely states. And I know, for instance, Eric Beverly's work on Hyderabad really brought this home to think about, whoa, you know, they don't have necessarily the same types of peoples of the periphery inside those princely states, yet this frontier governmentality if I subject it to the same type of, of characteristic check, does exercise itself in the supposed interior of British India along these frontiers, just as it does amongst American Indian reservations. So with that, I'd, I'd like to argue, you know, this is, a, this is a broader, more ambitious work. I leave it up to the reader to decide if I get there, but that's, that's really the aim as it were. Okay, and and looking at some of the questions, uh, there's there's a real um, continuity between what you've been saying and 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 a couple of these questions here. So, I'm I'm gonna uh, one of them is how do frontiers and this speaks it seems to me to to the issue of of princely states. How do frontiers operate differently from other types of colonial imperial national occupations in terms of resource extraction and institution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's. That's great. A great question. Um, so these places that I look at in the book are places that to begin with are in terms of the national treasury or the imperial exchequer poor, right? These are places of relative poverty in terms of they will become fiscal sinks. You can go in, you can probably conquer them, um, but is the cost of conquest and subsequent administration uh, going to be worth it. And most of these places, the answer to that return on investment uh, thinking is no, right? So beginning with that point, and, and I think we have to, to recognize that um, colonial and even national states in the late 19th century are relatively lean concern 
is omnipresent. Um, they are episodic at best, and they have to think about concentration of force, power, and manifestations of themselves. So that means geographically, where do we, you know, put our military? But it also means bureaucratically, where do we put our focus, for instance, in in the type of laws that we're going to um, not only apply but even develop. And so all of these places that uh, come under this rubric, at least in my book, are places of, of relative poverty. Um, they are also places where the natives are restless, right? These are people that will put up some sort of resistance to um, uh, subjugation to a centralized state authority. And so it, again, it goes back to this cost benefit analysis. If we have to go in, this is a poor place, we have to fight our way in and conquer these people, then why is it worth it? So then the question becomes, okay, what do you do? What do you do with these spaces? And the argument that I make in the book is, well, you encapsulate these people. You throw up a fence and you basically make them responsible for themselves. And you rhetorically uh, succeed in that move by saying, hey, we're gonna be culturally respectful here and we're gonna allow you to be governed by your own customs and traditions. But we as the state authority ultimately get to talk about or decide what are authentic customs and traditions. You see this in the tribal agencies on the Northwest frontier where the British put in place a law called the Frontier Crimes Regulation, which the, the gist of it, and we can get into the details of it, but the gist of it is that these people are gonna be subject to their own customs and traditions under the oversight of the tribal agent, who's of course the imperial official. And you know, on the one hand, the, the colonial state is telling itself a story that we're doing this because these people are problematic, we can't really trust them, and also we want to be culturally sensitive to who they are. Um, but on the other hand, there's a very kind of basic economic uh, algorithm going on, which is it's just not going to be worth it to conquer these people. We're not going to get as much out of them as it would cost to govern them or even to eradicate them. So let's just fence them in on really poor and really crappy land. And if we find subsequently that that poor and crappy land is not as poor and crappy as we thought it might be, then we can just clip it. And a great example of that is with the great as illustrative, not great as in good. An illustrative example of that is with the San Carlos Apache Reservation, which is the reservation of the Chiricahua Apache I look at in uh, Southeast Arizona. This is an executive reservation. So rather than being done or created by treaty with the US Congress, it's created by a presidential act uh, under, under US grant in 1872. And it's actually quite expansive at that time. Um, but by uh, 1880, um, the Phelps Dodge Corporation, the, the great mining conglomerate, has found the largest copper strike in the Western Hemisphere on the Southeast corner of that uh, reservation. And so of course it just goes to Washington and it has that reservation clipped. Um, and today, um, there's actually a picture of it at the end of the book. Um, it looks like you know multiple nuclear bombs went off because Phelps Dodge, which then went bankrupt and now the, the mine's owned by Rio Tinto, um, but you know takes and extracts the valuable place there or the valuable land and, and just really uh, makes it its own. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it, that reminds me of uh, uh, one of the wonderful characters in Catch-22, a Native American who, who's describing his past and how wherever his family moved, suddenly oil was discovered there and they were pushed out and they went somewhere else and then oil was discovered there and so on and so forth. Um, Another question that takes a, a different, but I think important uh, slant on these issues is, could you clarify what is modern about the model of frontier governmentality you propose? To take the South Asian example, what differentiates British Indian frontier policy from that of the Mughals? Mughals, right? Or let's push it back in time, because actually a great starting point is with a character that I've written about previously, a man named Mount Stuart Elphinstone, who was the first British plenipotentiary of the East India Company to visit the court of the Kingdom of Kabul, which is what the British then called what would become the state of Afghanistan. Um, now, why do I go back to 
Alfinson, who's dispatched in 1808-1809 to come to a defensive alliance with Shah Shuja, then the Emir of Afghanistan, or the, the court of the Kingdom of Kabul. Well, because when Alfinston goes up to the frontier, um, he's going as the first British official. So he's going to effectively a tabla rasa, like the British really don't know a whole lot about the Afghans. Um, but he has some models in mind. He's classically trained, right? He's gone to the University of Edinburgh. He's been educated by David Hume, sat in classes by Adam Smith. Um, so he's got some models. And one of those models, because he's got two books that he records in his journals that he's reading as he goes up to the frontier, is Tacitus's Germania, right? Like a good colonial official of that age. He's well-read in his Greek and Latin. But he's got Tacitus's basically um, model of how the Roman Empire deals with the Germanic tribes of the frontier. So it's definitely this idea of continuity through time that in a way the British Indian um, state or the American state with Native Americans is doing something that empires have done through world history. And certainly there is that continuity. We can disaggregate it because these states, the American state and the British Indian state have more capacity than these previous imperial constellations. And I think that's important to recognize, but it's more than just the qualitative power of the state. And this actually goes to something I didn't talk about in frontier governmentality. Why do I use the jargon? Why don't I just call it frontier governance, right? I mean, historians uh, generally shy from, from theory, but you know, every once in a while we do use this jargon. So why am I going all the way back to Foucault and talking about governmentality? And I think that really gets to the key of this question, which is what is different? And that is capitalism, global capitalism. Because what we have with these states in the 19th century, as Foucault articulates in his theory of governmentality, is you have the emergence of the economy as a state of regulation by the space. And that's something that only really happens from the early 19th century onwards. And that is embedded deeply at the heart of this system of frontier administration, frontier governmentality. How? Well, so to give a specific example, the Frontier Crimes Regulation, which is the key governing document that the British use along the northwest frontier of British India, and then gets replicated all around the, the uh, uh, empire. Um, the Frontier Crimes Regulation is supposed to be this kind of culturally conditioned response to what I call in the book, the problem of the Pathan, the Pathan being the colonial nomenclature for Afghans or Pashtuns, right? So what is the problem of the Pathan? Well, they're unruly, they're violent, they don't get our civilization, right? So the British are trying to tell themselves in part this administrative story about how it's, it's a culturally uh, conditioned response. But actually, the Frontier Crimes Regulation, which is first promulgated in 1872, has its origins in the Hazara Settlement Rules, uh, which had been published four years before in 1868. Hazara, the, the area of Hazara and Hazara Jat is along the uh, northwest frontier of Pakistan today. And the Hazara Settlement Rules, what those were, it was a 500 page report that was basically a tax document where the British go up to this space, try and figure out what is taxable and how to tax it. And in order to figure out what is taxable and how to tax it, they try and figure out local property regimes, right? And they get particularly confused amongst the Afghans of this space because the Afghans practice something called besh, which is a, a system of, uh, uh, co-ownership or co parency tenancy, where actually you have a, a common field, you get it for a couple of years, and then you swap it around. The British just couldn't wrap their head around this. But this was extremely important. And the reason it was so important is because property ownership, which is at the basis of modern capitalism, um, was the foundation of colonial rule in this space. So even though it's supposed to be culturally conditioned to the problem of the Pashtun, this is all about property. And it's that focus on property and economics, which moves me to governmentality, which is a long winded way of getting back to the question of what is modern about it? Money. <laughs>
it's really fundamentally about the operations of modern global capitalism, uh, uh, global capitalism as it's invented in the 19th century in these spaces. Great. Okay. You know, we're running out of time, uh, but I want to ask you one last question, and I apologize to everyone who, who, who get them asked. But this one, I think, will also take us up to the present in some respects. And the question is, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the ensuing convergences or divergences on how this logic creates formations of citizenship and sovereignty across the diverse geographies you link so well. It's a pretty dense question, but I think it's it's one that that gets at uh, some some important issues. I got to gather my thoughts for a second. On that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take a pop at sovereignty or because that that in a way is the easier one. Right, take but, take whatever you want. Right, you know, and and then I'll I'll, I'll move on to citizenship. Um so in part, this book is is an attempt. Actually, I you know I teach at a school of international affairs, so I'm embedded and surrounded by political scientists um, and, and by students that really uh, for they might delve in history or economics, but they they essentially think like political scientists. And um, no offense to any political scientist who might be uh, listening in, but I have always found the way that political scientists talk about sovereignty to be extraordinarily dissatisfying because always it's always been kind of an absolutist frame. You either have it or you don't, right? And part of what this book is do, and this is an increasing body of, of historical literature that has really challenged that and say, no, sovereignty is not like that. Sovereignty is actually extraordinarily divisible. We just haven't fully recognized it. I mean, a simple example in the United States which you think of as you know, the sovereign power par excellence is, is the um, hierarchical system of sovereignty that we call federalism. We have the sovereignty of the states. We have the sovereignty of the federal government. We have the sovereignty of Native American reservations who are legally sovereign. But then you get into the Supreme Court jurisprudence and they never actually kind of grapple with what that means to be sovereign. So, um, what am I trying to say here about sovereignty? Well, it's trying to say that um, our political vocabulary or our vo vocabulary for understanding politics has been um, greatly immiserated, and we need to recover that some. We need to recover and understand that the world we live in, um, which you're either a state or you're not, uh, is not the world of, uh, of the vast majority of human experience in human history, right? We, any of us that studied the past know that the world has been inhabited by empire, states, city states, tribes, you know, confederacies, all kinds of things existing alongside one another, not just states and non state actors. So, number one, it's a challenge to that. Um, number two, it's to say, well, you know, there are very real world implications to this emphasis on sovereignty and unitary sovereignty um, when governments say, hey, you know, we have control because we're sovereign we get to articulate who's in, who's out, who's a citizen and who's a subject or who's an object, right? Um, and I, I think that collapses uh, space for uh, negotiation or opportunities uh, for negotiation. Um, I think it also just ignores the past. I mean, what's amazing is to look at all of the spaces that I do in the book. And the, the opening page of the book actually begins not in the 19th century where I spend approximately 300 pages, but in 2014, 15. And it begins with the attack on the army public school in Peshawar. It begins with the kidnapping of the girls from Chibok in Northern Nigeria. And it begins with the uh, massacre at Garissa University in Kenya. And it says, you know, we think of this, these places and these events as joined by the global war on terror, which is still ongoing, but we don't talk about it anymore. But in fact, these places are joined um, by their positionality and their practices, which put them in the position of being frontiers, where the people that inhabit these spaces are less than, they're on the outs. Um, they are at best second class citizens. I mean, the United States today, Native Americans are American citizens, but you know, their, their citizenship is both individually and collectively second class and remains so 
as a legal category. If you just look at the operative laws um, for the United States and how the federal government governs or decides not to govern American Indian reservations, uh, you know, that continues to this day. Same with Pakistan. Only in 2001 are the uh, inhabitants of the federally administered tribal areas given Pakistani citizenship. And one of the most interesting but undiscussed movements going on in, in Pakistan today is something called the Pashtun Tawafuz movement, where you have the uh, Pashtun inhabitants of the Fata area who are protesting in Pakistan about their treatment by the Pakistani state. And the interesting thing is the claim they're making. The claim they're making is, don't treat us different. Don't treat us exceptional. Treat us like Pakistani citizens. We want the promise of citizenship, that universal rule of law. And yet the post-colonial order that we still live in, whether we recognize it or not, is the highly hierarchical and disaggregated way that states treat their own subjects, whether they be formal citizens or not. And I think that's one of the lasting things that really comes through in this book. Yes, it does. And you do it very effectively. And uh, I, I, I hate to bring this to a close, but we, we've gone on for a little over an hour. And uh, and I think you you have probably worn yourself out with, with, with uh, uh, this, this very articulate and compelling description of your book. So I want to encourage everyone, get the book. It's really wonderful. Uh, and there is a link to how you order it in the chat function that uh, 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 has has been posted. So uh, I, I want to thank Ben, and I want to thank everyone who's tuned in for this this conversation uh, today. Uh, thank you all very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor Kennedy, Thanks, Professor Hopkins. Thanks so much, everyone who attended. Yeah. Please stay tuned. We will have more book launches coming this semester. Okay. Bye. Bye.